protects them. Kids love it. I think the adults are having a little trouble. They're, they're finally getting recharged a little bit. <laughs> but in Vacation Bible School, the theme this year was Agency D3 or 3D? D3. 3D is like a movie. <laughs> Agency D3. And the assignment was to, uh, to look at uh, evidence. Evidence that would uh, substantiate these are some big words. I don't think they use those big words in, in the room, did you? That would substantiate the, uh, this man called Jesus. They looked at uh, evidence that uh, of his of the proclamation that he was coming. They looked at evidence concerning his birth. They looked at evidence concerning his life. They looked at evidence concerning his death. His, his betrayal, his death, his, uh, and his resurrection. And on the last day, uh, it came down to, to the fact of, of asking the question, or at least in the adult class, what are you going to do, or what do I do with the evidence about Jesus? Now the adult class and the teenage class didn't get to to finish the, the five sessions, they only finish four. So this morning we're going to finish session five. We're going to vacation Bible school again this morning. We're going to finish sex, session five. And I'm going to ask you the question. Based on the evidence that you know about, about Jesus Christ, about his life, about his birth, about his life, about his death, about his resurrection, what are you going to do with this extraordinary man? Extraordinary not in the terms of that men would call it extraordinary, but extraordinary in the, in the fact that all of the information that we, we looked at pointed to the fact that Jesus was the Son of God. That Jesus was the Messiah that Jesus was the Redeemer of the world. And that Jesus can, if you will just let Him, be Lord of your life through a personal relationship with Him. Our text uh, from uh, Agency 3D was taken from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. And I, you may not have one of those, but that's the, that's the uh, verses that we're going to be using. And we're going to put it up on the screen so you'll get to see what it says in the whole one Christian Standard Bible. If you would, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Does anybody remember what those verses are? They were our well, scripture for the week, weren't they? Have you already forgotten that? They were our scripture for the week. All right, well, Dwight remembers. Uh, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. And if you want to go ahead, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 2 uh, and start looking at verse 22. We're going to read uh, the, the scripture verse that we use this week for, uh, for vacation Bible school. And I, that, I think they paraphrase these two verses a little bit. But here's what they say in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. But set apart the Messiah as Lord in your hearts. And always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. However, do this with gentleness and respect, keeping your conscience clear so that when you are accused, those who denounce your Christian life will be put to shame. We are charged with being ready to give an account of the hope that lies within us. And I hope, I hope and pray that every one of you sitting in this room this morning can give that account. You can say that, that I am a born-again, baptized believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I was born again one day when I accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. 
I let him be Lord of my life. I let him cover my life with his precious blood. I followed him in believer's baptism, just as Miss Charlene did today. And now I'm walking each day with his help, the walk of a Christian. The walk of one who, who is able by, by word and by deed to lead others to the master. That's what we are charged with. In Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 22, Acts was, uh, is the book of Acts, the writing of the book of Acts is attributed to Luke. But a lot of the references are made uh, by Paul and some of the other uh, apostles and, and disciples of that day. And uh, we're going to look at Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 41. And I want you to look at the first few words of, of uh, verse 22 of Acts chapter 2. It says this, Men of Israel, listen to these words. How many of you have your listening ears on this morning? I heard that so much in vacation Bible school. And, uh, you know, turn, what is it? Turn your speaking voice off, off and turn your listening ears on. And they had to remind the kids continuously that uh, we need to turn our, our speaking voices off and our listening ears on. So Christians and, and uh, uh, visitors and whoever you are this morning, uh, turn your listening ears on and your voices off and listen to what the book of Acts has to say when it tells you, men of Israel, listen to these words. I get the impression that what is going to be said is going to be something important, don't you? If someone is telling you, uh, men of Israel, and you could say, ladies and gentlemen of Lakewood, listen to these words. And he goes on to say this, this Jesus of Nazareth was a man pointed out to you by God. God introduced him to you. And he goes on to say exactly how God introduced him to us. He said God introduced him or pointed him out to you with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him just as you yourselves know. Some of the evidence that God was with Jesus, that Jesus was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah, was the fact that that he could do miracles. Did y'all learn that in your vacation Bible school? And we need to, as adults, need to learn that as well. When we look at the evidence that is, is uh, proclaimed in God's Word, we see that Jesus Christ did miracles. He didn't seek out the, uh, the, the notoriety. He didn't even seek out the, uh, the, the task that would be classified as a miracle. They just kind of happened along the way as he, he journeyed and as he lived. But the fact is that Jesus did miracles. Things that you and I cannot do. Things that other people cannot do. That only God's Son could do. So the writer of the book of Acts is saying here, men of Israel or men and women of Lakewood, listen to these words. God has introduced you to Jesus Christ and he's done it through through many miracles, through wonders and signs. And miracles still happen today. What you saw this morning is a miracle. Every time a, 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 a person is born into the kingdom of God, that's a miracle. It's a miracle that, that God has, has allowed us to, to have access to, to his throne, to, to his, uh, his heaven, through the blood of his son Jesus Christ. Moving on to verse 23. Though he was delivered up according to God's predetermined plan and foreknowledge. And you use lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God and Jesus both knew what had to happen. There was no escaping the death of God's Son. If you and I were to be redeemed, if you and I, I were to be saved, Jesus had to die. There had to be a suitable substitute for us. And the only substitute was God's Son. And so the writer tells us 
that God planned it, God foreknew it, and you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and to kill him. Jesus was put to death by sneaky people. Wasn't he? He was put to death by sneaky people. That's all you can say. The Jews conspired against him. The Romans took part in it. But the Jews, the, the people of God, the people of, uh, that Jesus came for, conspired to kill Jesus. They had an opportunity at one time to release him. And yet, through their desire to get rid of him, they chose a common criminal to be released. In verse 24, it said, God raised him up ending the pains of death because it is not possible for him to be held by it. Let me tell you something this morning, folks. Jesus Christ is alive on the right hand of God, making intercession for you and I. Mm -hmm. He's not dead. He's not in the tomb. He's not on the cross. There's, no, there's nothing left there on that cross except empty wood. And we need to understand that we, we should never put Jesus back on that cross. He doesn't belong there. He paid our sin price once. We can't put him back again. We can't put him back in the grave. We should never put him back in the grave. We should celebrate the fact that he rose again and that God raised him up, ending the pains of, of death. Not only his pains of death, but your death and mine. The pains that we suffer. Because it was not possible for the, for the hold of death to keep him there. Then we move to verses 25 through 28. For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope. Because you will not leave my soul in, in Hades or allow your Holy One to see decay. You have revealed the paths of my life to me. You will fill me with gladness in your presence. Then we go on verses 29 through 32. Brothers, I can confidently speak to you about the patri patriarch David. He is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us today. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him, to David. God had sworn an oath to David to seek one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing this in advance, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not left in Hades, and his flesh did not experience decay. God has resurrected Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. People saw Jesus. Jesus wasn't in the tomb. In fact, the two ladies that went to the tomb that, that, that fateful day when they discovered his body gone saw the stone rolled away, saw the, the two men laying there uh, as dead men, and when they ventured inside the tomb, Jesus was gone. Some believe that, that Jesus' body was stolen. But let me remind you of a little history. Roman soldiers, when they were given a task, they were, were expected to complete that task. And they would have literally killed anyone that came close to that stone to try and move it. They would have literally killed them. Because if they hadn't de de defended that stone and kept it in place, they were subject to death. They were subject to losing their own life. So they weren't about to let anybody move that stone. But God reached out and he, he caused that stone to be moved and, and Jesus Christ rose from the dead and the Bible tells us many, in many places that people witnessed his resurrection. They saw him after he died, after he was buried, after the stone was rolled in front of the tomb. Jesus was seen by other people. Therefore, verses 33, starting in verses 30, verse 33, Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. 
For it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said uh, to my Lord, Set at my right hand. This is God talking to Jesus. Until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty <coughs> that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Redeemer. God has made it so. These are some facts that, that we see that, that the Bible uh, tells us about in many, many situations, many places, that Jesus Christ died on the cross at Calvary. He was removed from that cross. He was placed in a barred tomb. The stone was rolled in front of it. In a few days, the stone was moved. Jesus was gone, and he was seen by many people. He wasn't in the grave anymore. He had risen. And the Bible tells us that he is on the right hand of God. And that he is both Lord and Messiah. So you might ask the question, what did these people in the day of Acts, when they wrote the writing of Acts, what did they do with the evidence about Jesus? How did they handle the, the information that was, was being given to them. What did, what did they do? Look at 37 through uh, 41. We're going to look at those verses. When they had heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the disciples, Brothers, what must we do? Peter's sermon, the disciples' sermon, Work wasn't very long that day. It was a short and to, sweet and to the point sermon. A message of the redemption of God. And with that short message, those people that gathered around them asked them the question, Brothers, what must we do? And here's what Peter told them. Repent, Peter said to them. And he baptized each of you in the name of Jesus the Messiah for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent. What does repent mean? It literally means to be sorry and turn away from whatever is causing your problems. It doesn't mean you stay in them. It means that you, are, you repent and you literally turn away. It also means that you place your heart and your life in the hands of Jesus. It means that you will receive forgiveness of sins. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you know, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of people say that there are different gifts of the Holy Spirit. I believe the Holy Spirit's gift to us is salvation. I really do. I think that's, that's His gift to us. He leads us, He calls us, and He gives us that gift of salvation. And it goes on to say, and if you look at verses 39, for the promise is for you and your children and for all who hear, uh, who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And the many other words he testified and strongly urged them, saying, be saved from this corrupt generation. That's a message that needs to be proclaimed today from every pulpit. Repent and be saved from this corrupt generation. We live in a corrupt generation. One that seeks, to, as in, in Jesus' time, seeks to pull us away from the, from the, uh, the, the life of Christ, from the, the, the mercy of God, and from the grace that the Holy Spirit offers us through Jesus Christ. Moving on to 41. 41 is the one that most people like to, to look at when they talk about what happened that day. And it says, so those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. A short message, to the point, and people responded, and 3,000 people had their lives changed that day. That's what they did with the information that they gathered us as Peter and the apostles began to lay out the, the framework of, of salvation 
to the Jewish people. So my question to you today is this. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with the evidence? We had three young people who came to know Jesus as Savior and Lord during the vacation Bible study. Two girls and a boy. So you that are here this morning, what are you going to do with it? They took the evidence that they heard during vacation Bible school and they, they processed it, they looked at it, and they decided that Jesus Christ should be their Lord and Savior. What do you want to do? Some of you will write it off this morning and not do anything. Some of you will think about it. I'll decide later. Let me tell you something about, about deciding later or putting it off. There's nothing in God's Word that says you and I are going to have tomorrow. Nothing. Today may be the last day that you have to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just telling you the facts. These are the facts. People die every day. People die every day. And if you died today, if God called you home today, would you be ready to see him, to meet him? Some people are going to say, yes, I've been, been good. God, God will be standing up there with open arms waiting on me to get to heaven. Let me tell you something, folks. Here's another thing. Unless your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you will not see heaven. You can't be good enough. You can't be rich enough. You can't be smart enough. You can't come to church enough. You can't help other people enough to get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The only way you can come to the saving grace that God offers through Jesus Christ is through the blood of Christ. And that's accepting Him as your personal Savior. And that's your choice. It's not my choice. It's not your parents' choice. It's your choice. And that's the reason I asked you this question this morning. What are you going to do with the evidence? The evidence is clear. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. What are you going to do with that evidence? Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to have Jesus as our Savior. And Heavenly Father, give us this morning eyes and, and ears and hearts and, and minds that comprehend the fact that He is Lord of all. That no matter what the world says, no matter what Satan tells us, Jesus Christ is your Son. Jesus Christ was born into this world to pay our sin price. Jesus willingly hung on that cross, endured the pain and agony. His life was given up. He was buried. But God, death couldn't hold him. The grave couldn't hold him. He rose again. And now he makes intercession for us. And Heavenly Father, as the Holy Spirit works in our hearts this morning, call us to repent. Call us to salvation. Father, make it so hard and so burning in our lives that we can't resist the fact that you love us and you, you sent your son to die for us and now you're calling us to be your children. Father, I pray that you would work in the hearts of those here this morning that don't know Jesus. I also pray that you would work in the hearts of those that are here and, and already know him as their personal Savior and but yet, uh, something has gotten in the way. They're not serving Him as they should. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would call them to repentance as well. Rededication. That they too might serve you as they should. Father, we ask you that you bless this uh, invitation as we sing. And Father, just use it for your honor and your glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. If God has spoken to you through His Holy Spirit this morning and you feel like you need to come, even if it's just to pray, won't you do so?
But before you get up and sing, just think about just for a moment, what am I going to do about the facts about Jesus? Am I going to shove it aside or am I going to act? I pray this morning that God is calling you to act. Let's stand.